Does it ditch the first dish we put in is pumpkin pepper? That is true. And can you tell me about the dish? Uh, it is a vegetarian option that it is made out of the dish my mom used to do, but she used to make it with lamb and lamb stuffing. So we took that inspiration out of that dish and we made it as a vegetarian option. And I think sometimes we all struggle with the idea of what, how do we do vegetarian dishes? Or how can we recreate it with vegetarian food? Because eating vegetables is amazing, especially when they're in season. So it's a great way to kind of celebrate pumpkin in another way. And it's a hearty dish. Uh, it's definitely perfect for winter. And all the cheesiness coming out of it, that goodness. Wonderful. And we've paired it with a very light, fresh salad. That is true. We do have a lot of cheese with this dish. So we have the option to add the extra cheese or not. So it's an optional thing. I do, you know, you're having cheese, you're having cheese, you want it cheesy, you want a lot of it. And that's me. But I'm greedy and I like a lot of cheese around me. Uh, yeah, well, let's start well, packing. Okay. So we have the pumpkin. I don't know who's cooking with me and who is watching. So, so I'll do it a little bit smaller, even though I prefer them usually on a bigger size. Uh, this way you get a bit more color and they don't dry as much. But I'm making them small so we can roast them a bit faster. And this Having a kitchen helper. Usually in this kitchen, I'm the kitchen and I'm not the chef. Christy is usually the chef over here. So now we're taking over from her kitchen. So there is a lot of different pumpkins you can use. I'm using one that is more suitable for roasting. I told you that. It's always nice to go to a fruit and vet shop where you know the guy and you can actually talk to them about things. It's like going to a butcher and asking what kind of cut they have special and how to cook it. I'm adding a lot of olive oil. So please don't worry about my olive oil and salt. You do not have to use the same font. I know I'm a chef uh, and I use a lot of it. That's why I'm not allowed to keep it home as often. So we've got the pumpkin, salt, and garlic. Tossing it all together. That's it. Now we're putting it on a tray, spreading it nicely. Now I do add things and change recipes. So that's the beauty about recipe and food is you make it your own, you change it. Twist it, you add pepper, you add chili. And if you want to add a little bit of chili as well into this one, you can add some chili flavors into it as well. It just adds a nice kind of taste of spice. And you can add spicy flavor then it's going to add one. So I'm adding chili and this one all a little bit later. Um, so now what I want to do is do the bubble. So there is two ways doing the bulgur itself. I like the two ways, but this one is the easier one. So all I'm doing is putting the bulgur in here. So that is actually crushed wheat. Um, there is different coarseness to them. So I use the coarse one. All I'm adding is around one and a half liter of boiling water that we boil. Now there's two ways to do it. You can soak it a little bit if you want them very, very soft. But I like a little bit of texture because this way they soak all the juices out of the pumpkin and kind of have a bit more flavor. But when they are all cooked, they don't have the amount of food. So what I want to do is now from them being boiled, draining them a little bit, taking a little bit of the water, not too much of the water, dropping it over here, and now just spacing it and letting it steam. And that's it. And that's it. Yeah. And what I like as well about this one is you can use it as a substitute to rice. Right. So sometimes as well, you don't want to eat just rice. And the, it's a lot of tricks that growing up, I think, as a mom that had to feed my kids, you had to find alternatives to rice. And when she was cooking something, 
you know, she needed to feed you while the food is still being cooked. And my mom used to kind of feed us a little bit of the process of the cooking. So we would eat a little bit of the smoko and eat a little bit of the stew. She would mix it up together. You know, having to feed five kids is probably not an easy journey. Question for you is because a lot of people today are celiac or prefer to eat a gluten free diet, is there a substitute? Oh, there's all the gluten free foods as well that you can substitute the plant with it. Uh, you don't have to put it as well if you don't want to put and it with it. You know what we do at St. John's? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a great idea. I've never tried it with quinoa, but I'm sure it has the same concept. So this is the bugle over here. As you can see, it's starting to fluff up and steam and oh, yum, deliciousness. So we'll let it steam now uh, while we're waiting for our pumpkin to roast and then we can puzzle the whole dish together. So while we're doing this one, Lynn, uh, I wanna start cracking with the salad. So what, People get very stressed when you're entertaining because a lot of the time you have to do everything at the last minute. And to me, when I have guests over, all I like to do is prep everything in advance. And then when people walk in, all you need to do is just put final touches and seasoning and all those things. So I've got some pine nuts over here. Um, and all I want to do is just get a bit of flavor out of them, get the oil. Kind of pop in. Another one that's what we're talking about. So, you, we don't want to roast it too much. All we want to do is just get a little bit of color, get those beautiful oils going through, just to get those aroma as well in the kitchen going. So, fresh through. I am trying roasting them, I'm just not. Roasting them in oil or anything like that. Uh, just so that we sustain the integrity of the pine nuts. And nuts have enough oil in them anyway. Right. And when you over roast them as well, you get the bitter flavor and you want the weakness, the nuttiness. So while we're doing the salad over here, I love fennel. Love fennel. It's fresh. It's Light, it has this nice tanginess to it, the licorice flavors that you get out of it, and it works really well for me for salads, especially when you're doing something rich. Uh, you know, is a great balance, and a lot of the time, all of these I love picking because I love adding them into the salad. You're getting this kind of nice freshness to them, and adds the Sorry, I love eating and talking and <laughs> doing all those things together. Sorry, I forgot something very, very important is pouring a glass of wine. I think when you're cooking, you want to enjoy the journey. And one of the parts of the journey is kind of you're at home, glass of wine is important. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> in the sip of wine. So I'm getting the panel over here and I'm using a mandolin. Now please use the guard because it can be very dangerous. I know I'm doing you to do that. It can be very, very dangerous. That it's yeah. so, um, what I like doing, but I like it eating it fresh, so I like seasoning the salad as close as possible. But if you are having it for later on, putting it in a little bit of water and some lemon juice, just squeeze the lemon over it. The smell of fennel is just beautiful. We get a mixing bowl for that. <laughs> That is perfect. Just, it's a beautiful part of the smell. 
So what I'll do is put them in a <laughs> bowl. We won't leave them on the pan because you don't want to burn them. And they'll continue to cook. If you leave them in the pan, they'll mm. continue to cook. So we'll put it on the side. Taking the fennel out. <laughs> What's beautiful about salads as well, there are I love salads because you have to leave one hero ingredient and then all the rest needs to work with that hero ingredient. And I find sometimes that people usually try too hard with their salads. The most impressive thing usually with salads is keeping the integrity of the main vegetable. So you need to pick one hero ingredient. and maximize the flavor on that hero ingredient. Oh, the beautiful Andy. So here we go. All seems to come together. And as well, we said it's all about the plating is how you actually present a salad because it can go from the most simple thing to the most exquisite thing. Now I'm taking some cucumbers and I'm doing them into nice ribbons. Nice and firm, all going in. So now, so far in the salad, what we've got is the fennel, the cucumber ribbons. I got some dill over here. So all I'm doing is just chunking it very coarsely. Cooking at home is all about leaving it in its simple format, not too much chopping and not too much cutting. It's about enjoying the meal and making it look very aesthetically pleasing. And now I have some mint and I'm tearing all the mint leaves. As you can see, there's not really much chopping in here. And as you can see, everything as well is about complementing the hero ingredients. And our hero ingredient over here is the fennel. So now that I added the fennel, I added the mint, I'm adding parsley, you can chop it coarsely or just pick the leaves in. And it's just, the green is something special about when you're cooking. It just has a magical flavor, magical color, and a lot of healthiness in one thing. I'll clean a little bit my mess for a second while now I like plating salads in a very flat platter. But the reason for that is I get a little bit more surface, and with the surface that we get, we can style the salad a little bit more limp, and it gives it a nice texture as well to the salad itself and a different volume that a lot of people don't actually do with salads. They pile them usually in, in a bowl. And I love when it is a bit more flatter because then you can get all these greens to kind of have a little bit more volume inside it. So now I'm using some lemon juice. So I'm using my hand as the strainer. COVID is not a great time to use your hands for anything, but <laughs> I'm the one eating it, so I'll be fine. <laughs> and here we go. Some more lemon. I like it sharp acidity to it. But if you don't like 
as much lemon. You don't actually have to put the lemon in. I'm adding a lot of extra virgin olive oil into my salad. And as I said, I love more salt than the average person. And as you can see, it's really simple. It's not a complicated so this delicious. Salad. And now is plating time. So as you can see, this salad is going to this really big platter. And you always start from the center of the platter and then with your fingers you kind of just open it up a little bit the ribbons you roll a little bit so this way you've got some different volumes in your salad and you're getting this nice textures and volume and and now we're building it up slowly, slowly, and the cucumber ribbons are starting to get volume. It's simple, but it is impressive. The colors, the textures. Now what I wanna do is add some feta as well, break some feta on top of it. And you can see it's simple, but there is something very delicious about and building fresh. salads like that. Yeah. And fresh. And now the pine nuts as well. And you could have put that all in a bowl, but you wouldn't be able to see. No, you don't get the same effect. And then you continue building slowly, slowly on your salad. And it's all about the hero ingredient. And the hero ingredient over here is fennel and everything else should work around it. So if you're having this with a steak, you should be a happy person. A piece of grilled salmon, some chicken, or just lunch. Just delicious. Or just a salad on its own. Just a salad on its own. So if I was, a, so if I was entertaining yep. and I wanted to do some preparation in yep. advance, what, how, how would you... So I would shave the fennel, put it in a little bit of water with some lemon juice. Right. Just this way they don't go right. darker in right. colour. Right. Shave the cucumber, pick all the herbs, sauce the pine nuts. And, and then, then when all people... separate bowls? Yes. Okay. And then when people come in, all you need to do is just put mix it together. It. Yeah. Yum. Are we allowed to taste them? Are we allowed to taste? <laughs> Look at Sharon. <laughs> is, this, is this our Jeffrey? <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Let's see Some what you think. Shake on there. Yeah. Shake from the plate. Oh, well, I want to get a little bit of the cheese, a little bit of everything. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to get it. Well, it's, well, it's simple. It's not complicated, mm -hmm. but you're getting the pine nuts. You're getting the kind of licorices out of the fennel and then the cooling cucumber flavor and the nice herbs in it. And it really, how long did it take us to do it? Two minutes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't need more than two minutes to create the most magnificent salad and I think people complicate sometimes salads a bit too much. Absolutely. This is so fresh. Just, Michael, what kind of feta do you use? Uh, this one I'm using a Greek feta. Um, Tempo does a really good feta as well, kind of in that texture of that Greek mm -hmm. feta, so you get that kind of firmness mm -hmm. and that kind of 
crumbliness in it because when you're using Danish fetas, they're just a bit too creamy mm. to go with textural salads. So you have them with this a bit more fur. Absolutely firm. delicious. And I wish that everybody could taste <laughs> it right now. Do you want to mention that the salad is in this book? The, the salad that we're using is in the first cookbook, Falafel for Breakfast. Uh, it is actually inspired by my brother-in-law that we went to his house one day and he still cannot remember that he did a salad similar to this one. <laughs> that we had dinner with them in Melbourne and he made the salad similar to this one and I went, I need to perfect that salad and I think that this is the ultimate for me fennel salad. So I call it Tom's fennel salad. It's just a contribute to his inspiration and i think that's what's beautiful about food is we go out we get inspired inspired even as a chef you still get inspired by other people's cooking that's and really you get inspired by home cooking not just by other chefs cooking and the simplicity yes that's what's so lovely the magical simplicity of about only, simplicity. A few, only a few ingredients so now you have to test because the chef hasn't eaten that's a problem. I had the wine. <laughs> <laughs> I know you had the wine. Okay. Mm. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pine must have come through as well towards the end. And... But I think you've always said that salads shouldn't have so many ingredients. <clears throat> I'm a big believer in that, that salads need to have a soul of their own. It's not a mixed thing. And kind of when I started dating Christy, um, her salad was every vegetable in the fridge went into one salad. And that horrified me. So I used to call them Kiki salad, the Christy salad because she would just add everything from mushrooms and lettuce and our capsicums and tomatoes and cucumbers and everything that she had in the fridge she would just put in one salad and to me that is not a salad that's just vegetables went into a bowl that, that's a salad for some right, people of course yeah. it's a salad for some, but this is absolutely delicious let's start with the next project now Wonderful. that we have a lovely salad let's check the pumpkin the pumpkin seems to be ready. Perfect timing. So as you can see, everything is soft and mushy. Now we have to puree it all together. You can smell the garlic, the pepper, the olive oil. One thing is never compromise with a good quality olive oil. You use average ingredients, you get an average dish. Um, you use amazing ingredients, you're gonna get an amazing dish. My easiest technique, taking it like that with your hands on both sides, something it all in. Thanks to my amazing kitchen hand. So I'm using a potato musher and mushing it all together. Michael, what temperature did you roast the pumpkin? I roasted on 180, but you can roast it on higher temperature. And you can change it all around. So as long as it is soft and mushy, uh, I like to roast them even higher temperature on bigger chunks so I get that nice caramelization. We all know vegetables and fruit have a lot of sugars in them and when you roast them nicely you get that additional flavor, that kind of caramelized natural flavor without adding any sugar. Uh, you can always add as well a little bit of honey if you want the additional sweetness but I find pumpkin is sweet enough anyway. So what I want to do over here is mix those two ingredients together so we have a nice mush pumpkin. Now I will gurgle into it. So 
water and now all I'm making is kind of like a batter out of it. Now the thing about cooking, at least in a professional kitchen, is seasoning all the time, every step of your cooking. Uh, that's kind of what they teach you a lot in cooking schools, is never wait till the end to season. You roasted the pumpkins, you season them. The next stage as well that we're doing now is seasoning as well and continuing the seasoning process all along. So you start with a little bit of seasoning, little bit of seasoning. So you just say every step of your cooking is always seasoned. So I want to taste before I start adding my spices. So it's missing a tiny bit of salt. More pepper because I can. So I'm eating it, so I can add more salt. Absolutely. Michael, what is the favorite salt that you like to use? I, I see it's very coarse. I like a Malden sea salt, uh, but I use different salts for different uses. So sometimes when you're putting it in boiling water, you don't really need to use an expensive salt. You can just use table salt. This is cinnamon. Wow. Now, there's something about Mediterranean food that they add a lot of cinnamon in main dishes, in stews, in savory in dishes, savory dishes okay. that kind of in the Western world, they connotate cinnamon with dessert. Where is it? Right. So over here, we have the cinnamon and some cumin powder. Now, the cumin doesn't want to come out from that side, so we'll trick it to the other side. Now, if you like it more seasoned, that's what's the beauty about cooking. Now, if you don't want to use pumpkin and you don't like pumpkin, you can use carrots. Uh, so you can change the recipes or you can use half carrots, half pumpkin. Let's now taste again. When you're tasting seasoning, you always need to have a fresh spoon every time. No double dipping. Let's see about what you think. Does it need more salt to your liking? It's delicious. So what I like is that balance between the garlic and the cinnamon. And it just opens the whole flavors up together. And the cumin and the, and the cinnamon, it's just a beautiful combination. Yes. When you look at a lot of Moroccan cooking, there's a lot of that included in it. So now I'm putting a low layer at the bottom. And then we're going to move into the cheesy part of it all. So I'm using this really beautiful terracotta. dish. Because I feel that it is a beautiful dish. Because we use it's a rustic this, dish yeah, that works with them. And it's been with us for years. So it's it's a dish that Christy brought with her from Portugal in one of her trips, and she carried that with a mortar and pestle. And I think there's something beautiful about it. For the last 16 years, we host a lot of food with it for people. So it has all these, I think, pots and pans that have marks. It's like books that have a lot of oil stains on them. They have been loved. And there's something beautiful about loved pots and pans and loved cookbooks. So now I'm adding a lot of cheese. So this would be, you could use the tempo shredded cheese. You definitely can. Any shredded cheese that is your preference, the tempo one would definitely work really well with that. Um, but I would not use a buffalo mozzarella or right. any of those right. things inside right. it because they're just a bit too wet. Right. And then they will make it. So now all I'm doing is flattening it all up. Mm -hmm. It's just that when I spread the second layer on top, I'm able to spread it a bit right. easier. Right. Deliciousness. And now our second layer. So now gently. Spreading it around the dish. Oh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm a chef. I'm being dramatic. <laughs> I wasn't getting enough attention. So here we go. Sorry for that, Lynn. So now I want to add a nice shine on top of it as well. So now I'm adding more oil because I can and because I want. And now smoothing it all up and adding the extra flavor into it. Now I am going to be adding a little bit more salt on top, regardless to you loving the balance of flavor so far then. Michael, we have a question from one of our watchers. Can you use quinoa instead of fulgur? You can definitely use quinoa instead. It will be almost the same effect. Um, so yeah, you can definitely use that. Or you can use lentils as well if you'd like, just don't cook them as much. So now I want to give it these kind of diamondy marks just to give it that authenticity kind of visual to it. You know, a bit similar to a baklava kind of. And then flip it, and we can do it all like that, diamondies. Or with a little bit of an angle to be a bit fancier. Let's be fancy. Let's be fancy. <laughs> We're being fancy because we can. Because we want to. Because we are. <laughs> So if you wanted to make this dish in advance, what would you do? So I will do it to this stage, right. put it in the fridge, get right. it out a couple of hours before because you need to get it to room temperature, and then just bake it when you need it. Beautiful. And so, look at that. Now, if you That's really want to be very, very fancy, you can add an almond on every one of the diamonds, a bit like a nana style. <laughs> And that goes back into the oven for how long? So this one would go in, now every, every step of it is actually cooked, so there is no perfect cooking for right. it. It's what you like. I like that there's a nice crispiness at the top. Right. Because that's another texture that you're actually getting out of it. So I would leave it in around 20 minutes, 25 minutes, uh, or till you get that nice golden brown color. And we'll now have to wait and see how cheesy and delicious we're and gonna I'm get sure out of it. We have lots of questions. Folks, if any of you have any questions for Michael, either uh, raise your hand if you want to ask your question live, and then we'll call on you and you can unmute yourself or type it into the chat box. We're giving Michael a, a wine break here. <laughs> a wine break is a very important break. <laughs> now, the advantage about having wine at home is you don't need to drive home. Exactly right. Exactly right. So if you serve the pumpkin pibe as part of a meal, mm -hmm. what would you serve, aside from a, from a very fresh salad, what would you mm -hmm. serve with it? Oh, uh, it could definitely be part of a bigger meal because yeah. we all love tasting a lot of food. Right. And when you are cooking at home and it's nice to have this kind of vegetarian option of a vegetable because it's nice to be very, very creative with your vegetable. Right. So I like this and then you're serving it with two different salads and some pickles because you need that kind of sour flavor when you're eating kind of things that are very, very rich. Right. So making your own nice pickles, like a nice cauliflower or carrot pickle or nice olives, but you need olives that have this nice bitterness. I love olives more bitter olives. Right. Kind of those natural, sometimes you can buy them and make them by yourself at home, kind of grind your own olives. There's something, I think, spiritual about doing things from scratch. Absolutely. Like we were Absolutely. having this conversation earlier about kind of COVID, how it made us do a lot of different things at home that we out of our comfort zone, like doing our own sourdoughs, doing our own pickles, doing things, baking, like having as well cakes for lunch. 
you were guilty <laughs> of bringing me a cake one time for lunch. And this recipe comes from this lovely book. This recipe comes from my second cookbook, Hamas and Cove. Uh, it's a very loved and special book for us because this is kind of a book that is based mostly on home entertaining, right. uh, things that we love having and eating at home. Kind of, and do you have a favorite recipe? Oh, this is like picking your favorite <laughs> child. You do have one, but you can't say it. <laughs> 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 I'm sure everyone there just believes me as well. <laughs> you always but say you love them all equally. <laughs> Everyone's special. Everyone um, is special. But are there recipes that are your go-to recipes from your book that you would... Uh, I, I love a lot of things, but my cooking and hosting at the home is keeping it very, very simple. And there right. is this beautiful lamb shoulder recipe in this one that it's so easy it's only taking a lamb shoulder rubbing it with some coriander seeds olive oil salt and really putting it inside the oven eight hours and you come back you just give it a little bit of color and you're done and i love those recipes because they make your life comfortable and sometimes on a kind of friday morning you just put it in the oven and you know by five in the afternoon you just need to take it out of the oven and it's ready for your meal or a Sunday when you have early guests coming in and you really can't be bothered cooking and we all go through that Absolutely. stage and you really are exhausted and you want to impress without doing all the hard work so and I think that recipe to me is just magical because I can wake up in the morning Shove it in the oven. Absolutely. Take it out of the and oven when they walk in. And it's a beautiful Shabbat dinner. Yes, perfect. It's it's kind of comfort eating. Absolutely. And Australian lamb is just beautiful. magical. Really beautiful. And there's a sorry. And there's a recipe of a cake, an almond and coconut cake in this book as well. That it's just my go-to cake because it's a five ingredients. It doesn't need a mixer. It doesn't need anything. All you're mixing it is the west putting it in the oven easy and that's what we need sometimes absolutely. not all the absolutely. time absolutely. but the persian love cake oh the persian love cake. oh my god that is what's, the, what's the temperature for the lamb what's the temperature, the temperature for the lamb i put it on 160 for eight hours i started with the first hour on 180 then drop it down to 160 and just leave it in the oven one Michael, if you were going to do a fish uh, protein along with the pumpkin kibbo, mm. how, how would you do the fish? What, what uh, you? I am. A, I know a lot of people like the fish filleted. I am a big fan of whole fish. I think there's something special about eating things off the bone. Uh, the flavor is still there. The integrity of what we're eating is still there. Like, uh, I, I know all the new generation thinks that steaks grow in a backpack container <laughs> in the supermarket. And they don't? They don't. Oh. <laughs> they don't. They actually are an animal. And growing up, um, kind of my grandma was very, for her, was very important that we ate every little piece of of the animal because for her it was you needed to respect it. If it was right. slaughtered for you, you have to respect the soul of that animal and parts that you can't actually eat, you give them to your neighbors that can actually eat them. So it's the respect of the animal. And I think eating things off a bone or stewing whole things with a bone has a spiritual thing. It's right. the respect that we have to give back to the animal and knowing where we source those things from. It's not just buying a lamb, it's knowing where that lamb is coming from. Asking those questions, it's, it's important for the sustainability of, of the earth we're and, living and in. And the same with the fruit and vegetables, so oh, you know the growers where they come from. And eating seasonality. And, and we have a question. We have a question. What made you want to be a chef? Uh, I think I was very, very inspired by my love of my parents and grandparents for food. I think I'm the only child in the family that actually is the black sheep of the family. They all 
love working mostly in offices and things like that. But for me, the love of seeing the whole family together and growing up when my grandma would come over and would do biscuits with my mom and the neighbors and kind of when it brought people together. And I think that immediate satisfaction that bringing people together, it has a feeling that not many other industries have is that sense of immediacy. It's like when you cook something and then when people come in and then you just the smell and food. And, and sharing. And yeah, there's something spiritual. Where did your family come from, your parents and your grandparents? So my parents were born in Israel, uh, but my dad's family is originated from Greece. Greece? Yes. Oh. Santorini. Beautiful. I know I've never been there. <laughs> I have actually never been there. The most beautiful so, Greek island. I, 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 I have never been there. It's on my list. I, I think that we've all got a lot on our list on the boy bomb. And at the moment, I'm yes. just getting. Well, that's what, the fun part is, is making the list because we're not going to right you, you know what we've been doing recently as well from the whole trips of holidays is cooking things that are related to a country that you want to visit. And it's just getting you closer to that country or getting you closer to planning that's lovely, that. It's a lovely idea. Kind of, if you feel like you want to go to Italy, have a dinner party that is Italian influence. If you want to go and visit Israel, cook out those books. <laughs> <laughs> there is a special kind of tomato that they grow on Santorini, and they make like a, a sort of a latke with it. Yum. You need to look that up. But it's a, it, that tomato has a special flavor that you really can't Yeah, but it's the, the natural. But, earthiness and as well mm. probably the ground is very volcanic so it's very mineral yes. and it's closer to the sea so the tomatoes would have this natural saltiness to them so you get that nice combo that over mineral that nice sun as well because most places in the mediterranean it doesn't rain over summer so you get those natural um kind of not from, kind of uh ripening natural ripening of the fruit and veg and it's not what as lucky as we actually are in in our western world but a lot of our fruit and veg has been refrigerated for a long period of time and when you go to places like santorini or you go to kind of country sites in israel or kind of different third world countries the vegetables actually have much more flavor and every time when I go to visit my mom in Israel and when she's chopping cucumber and tomato, you can actually smell it from the other room. Well, over here, you chop tomato and cucumber and it smells like cowboy sometimes. So you need to kind of Absolutely. know where you're buying your fruit and veg and kind of be a bit more inspired in knowing and supporting as more smaller producers. And in our economy at the moment, is is all about making sure that that little supplier has an existence. Yes. And we need to make sure that all these people that are tiny operators will still be continuing to operate after COVID. Absolutely. Have I have a, a, yes, yes, we have more questions um, from yeah. Yaffa. Do you smoke your own trout at the restaurant or do you buy it already no, hot smoked? No, we smoke everything from scratch. And it's pretty easy to do the smoking. It's not really that difficult. Uh, if you have a barbecue, you can actually do it over your barbecue. So all you need is one tray. Um, then you need some wood chips that you can get from Bunnings or anywhere that you'd like. Put them in a little bit of uh, aluminum foil, burn them a little bit, then put another lid on top of it and let it smoke. So you cure it a little bit before, so you put it in salt and a bit of sugar, flavoring, flavoring kind, kind of thing. Right. You kind of wipe it off it. You give that at least a six hour process. And then you light the barbecue on while you're smoking it. And then you're getting hot smoked. And it's really the easiest thing to actually do. And it, it's impressive. And you can get those beautiful Japanese smokers as well that you can find. And they look a little bit like a like a cylinder, a big cylinder that has that base already done for you. So if you wanted to smoke your own salmon steaks and smoke a piece of brisket or 
a piece of meat or any kind of fish or vegetables as well. I love smoking my own lovely as well. Kind of, you then, smoke the lovely? And it is beautiful. And then you add this nice sweetness to it, the pomegranate, and I add it with some candied pistachios. Mm -hmm. So I make a caramel and I dip the pistachios inside it. And then you chunk <laughs> it and then you're getting that nice creaminess, saltiness, smokiness, <laughs> and sweetness and that burst of acidity out of the pomegranate. So it's magical. Do you serve that in the restaurant? We do. Uh, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but another question for you. This is going to be a tough one for you, Michael. What is your favorite raw ingredient to cook with and what do you make with it? Well, uh, my favorite raw ingredient would be definitely eggplant. Uh -huh. I know it's a surprising answer, but eggplant is, is one of those things, a bit like mozzarella cheese, you can make with it whatever you want. So when you smoke it, you get that beautiful eggplant dip and you mix it with tahini and then you can layer it as a moussaka and uh, you can have it just roasted with a bit of miso and steam it a little bit and you get that beautiful kind of goo in it. It has a nice meaty flavor if you smoke it. And you have a beautiful recipe for pickled eggplant. Uh, I, I love it, baby eggplant. And I think it's very versatile. A lot of people are very scared cooking with eggplant. That to me, it becomes a challenge. What can I make stuffing eggplants? And you can make so much out of it. And there's so many varieties out there that I think a lot of people just pick an ingredient that is a much easier ingredient to work with. Hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I think you absolutely <laughs> did. <laughs> you waxed lyrical about <laughs> eggplant. <laughs> There's a, a, some people say before you cook with eggplant, you need to slice it and salt it for a while. Other people say, no, you don't need to salt it. So different uh, varieties of eggplant require different things. But when you are using a bigger eggplant, the reason you do that is to get a bit of the bitterness and to get the excess liquid out of it. Because most yes. vegetables would yes. have, have like water. eggplant, it's like a sponge to kind of moisture and, and water. So they grow on a lot of water. And that additional salt will get the bitterness out of it and would get that excess moisture out. So when you're frying it or grilling it, you'll get a nicer caramelization and it doesn't get too much wetness around and doesn't bubble in your frying. And there was also something I read once about, you can tell if an eggplant is a male or a female eggplant and which uh, yes, one is better. Yes, yes, yes. Apparently the female eggplant, not surprisingly. Not surprisingly. <laughs> it's like the female zucchini flowers are always better. Always better. <laughs> okay. Don't see any more. Anybody else have any questions? Oh. Something is coming out of the oven. Mm, wow, look at this. Look at the cheese bubbling on the side. So now yeah. I like it a little bit firmer, but just not to keep you all with a big anticipation. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So it is delicious. I'm sure it's delicious. <gasps> but and there are no calories in this. Let it sit a little bit. Don't be greedy like me. That I am constantly greedy. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to burn your tongue with the cheese bubbling hot. But it's not gonna stop me. And can you hear those noises of mm. sizzle? Beautiful, beautiful. Just it is the most simple dish to do. How about I give you a taste this one then? While you're dishing up, Michael, we have a question about the salad yep. from Yvonne. Can you use goat's cheese instead of the feta over uh, the salad? Absolutely. You know what is beautiful about cooking? Is making the recipe now your own. Is Changing the feta to ghost cheese and yep. <laughs> so 
knows is amazing. It's the cinnamon. Right. <laughs> it needs to cool down so it kind of has a nice breaking to it. Very good. Yvonne it's says yum. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure the kids would love this. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. It's absolutely. elegant flavor, it's simple, it's delicious. Just beautiful. Absolutely. Wow. Beautiful. Do we have any more questions? You know, oh, we've, we've done the answer that one. No? Oh. And with a little bit of salad. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, we have a question here. Someone is saying, do you, do you taste the pumpkin in this? It doesn't taste like, a, this is from me. It doesn't taste like a piece of pumpkin wood. It's, it's, it's much, it's sophisticated. There's something different about it. Um, so I hope that answers the question from a taster. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. It's nice and cheesy, mm. sweet and salty. Tell us, Michael, about your restaurant. Tell us about the restaurant. Uh, I do have two restaurants and a catering. So we have Keppel Street Kitchen that is located in Redfern, and we have Keppel and Co that is located on Dang Street in Waterloo. Wow. And we have uh, our catering as well. Then we have our kosher branch and the non-kosher branch. And it's called Kipos Catering. You have to come in and visit and have a look. And we do our kosher pop-ups twice a year. So hopefully this year we'll do it towards November this year. Uh, we're very excited when we do our kosher pop-ups. Um, they and do you have to book in a, book as uh, soon as it comes as it up. Comes you have to book down, because yeah. they are sold out in a it's matter of two sometimes nights hours, and they are sold out quickly. Yeah, we do get an amazing support for those kosher pop-ups. So I'm grateful to all of you that have been or will be at any of them. Well, Yaffa says your food is outstanding. Thank you, Yaffa. <laughs> <laughs> it must be an enormous job to convert the kitchen to kosher. It is a ginormous job. It's a very unprofitable <laughs> evening to actually do. Uh, but I think it's a great way to introduce people to what we do that would not usually be able to dine in Sydney. And Sydney is one of those places where there is not much sophisticated places. And... The, the guests that keep kosher all the time have an extraordinary amount of palate because they would cook amazing food most of the time at home, but they would never be able to go out to any place in Sydney and actually enjoy quality service and quality ingredients, a nice wine list and the whole service approach to it all. And I think that's what we try to do with our kosher pop-up is give people the ability to be able to go out and dine in a one-hatted restaurant that respects the ingredients, respects the customer, the steps of service is a great wine list. We try to select kosher wines from France and uh, Rioja from Spain and Australian wines and Israeli wines. So we have a nice collection that you can have a nice glass of kosher champagne. That we usually have a nice kosher champagne so we try to select a nice selection of different things from around the world so Michael, to match it. Talk to us about being a restaurateur in these times of COVID. Well, I think we've all, regardless to the job that we're doing, we've suffered from COVID in some way or another. But I think it brought in as well a lot of extraordinary things. Uh, one of the things is how we change and adjust our businesses to fit in with the world of the moment. And, at the moment, as much as we would love to die now, we're still a little bit worried. We're still a little bit scared. And righteously, look what happened now in Victoria. And it's not an easy process to digest. So we want them to still eat restaurant food. We still want to support restaurants. But we don't want to do it the way we did it before. 
So what we did is we converted our front room at Capel Street Kitchen into this really Mediterranean Israeli deli with having tina that we import from Israel and different kind of products. And then we do all our own home dips and salads and uh, cured meats and fishes and different things that people can take restaurant quality ingredients, small batch done product to their home without them having to feel pressured in dining in a restaurant, but they're getting quality right. product that is not mainstream supermarket product. So yes, it would not last like a supermarket because it doesn't have the preservatives. Right. It doesn't have the additional salts and citric acid, but yes, it would be a two day product or a three day product in your fridge, but it's a two, three day product that you know that it's healthy, good for you that it is done by professional chefs, that is packaged beautifully for you and done with nice service on the same price bracket as you would get it in mainstream shops. And so delicious. Oh, you've experienced so it. Delicious. You've, you've purchased some. I have indeed. Do we have any more questions, Claire? That's it. Are you right on air clock? So, Michael, thank you. Thank you to everybody for joining us. We have had, I hope you've had as much fun as we've had because we've had the most delicious hour. Oh, thank you it's for been having wonderful. Me. And thank you so much for the delicious food and for your warmth and generosity of spirit in sharing all of this with us. It's just been a joy. Thank you to Sharon and thank you to Lauren. Thank you to Ilana for being admin. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody next time.